Hi there! Welcome to History in Retrograde. This is the podcast where we use the ancient art of astrology to help us better understand the past. I'm your co-host, Chandra O'Quinn, and joining me live via satellite is my mom. Hi, Mom! Hello, Chandler. How are you? I'm doing very well. Are you ready to begin another grand experiment? I am. I'm always ready to go on another adventure with you. All right, let's give it a whirl. All right, let's go. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to all of our wonderful, wonderful listeners who we love very, very much. And thank you all for being there and for sharing the show. And just want to send you some love. Yes, uh, thank you so much to uh, everyone uh, who's listening out there uh, across this uh, great nation and all over the world. Uh, we uh, truly appreciate uh, each and every one of you. And uh, for those of you, if this is your first episode of History and Retrograde, uh, welcome. Uh, the way that we uh, do things around here is that in a moment, I will give the uh, astrological birth data uh, necessary for mom to create a, a birth chart of a random historical figure. Uh, now, uh, you, the listening audience, already know who this uh, mystery history guest is. It is in the title of today's episode. I, of course, know who it is because I selected this person, but Mom has no idea who this person could be. Uh, so in a moment, I will give her the data necessary to create the astrological birth chart. That is the birth date, time, and location uh, for this mystery history guest. She will then input that data into the BAT computer, and out will come the astrological birth chart, where all of the planets, moons, and stars were at the moment that person was born. She will then do her best to give a uh, blind uh, reading of this uh, chart, uh, telling us what she can about the different personality traits, fortunes, uh, personality characteristics of this person. Uh, I will then uh, ask a few discussion questions, reveal to her who our mystery history guest is, and then give a little background about the person. And at the end, we will uh, decide how accurate the chart was at uh, figuring out who this person would be. Uh, so without further ado, let us begin. All right, I'm ready. Uh, so this is a male. All right. Uh, born on the 20th mm -hmm. of June. All right. 1763. Okay. Do we have a time? We unfortunately do not have a time on this one, so we'll have to go with noon. All right. And where in the world? Ireland. Ireland. Oh, we're going to Ireland, are we? Uh-huh. And where in Ireland? Dublin. Dublin. There we go. All right. Uh, so again, this is a male, born June 20th, 1763. Uh, we were not able to find a birth time, uh, so we went with noon, and this is in Dublin, Ireland. All right. Well. I believe this is a splash chart if we've ever seen one. <laughs> it is very splashy. Ah. Uh... You're good. You're really good, Chandler. You're really getting good at this. Um, recognizing things right away. This is very interesting because this is, I believe, the first chart that we've had such a close... Uh, well, oh, well. We set it for noon, right? Uh, yeah. Interesting. I wonder why it shows 28 degrees. That's interesting. As the Why, ascendant? You know, the, yeah, the program chose 20, 28 degrees. Uh, as the ascendant, 28 degrees Virgo. Very interesting. Um, okay, so I think I want... Well, now see, here's the thing. We don't have a time on this one. So having it be a splash chart, maybe, maybe not. So because we don't have an official time, but as it stands right now, it is. Uh, all right. So let's just start on this one at the beginning because we don't have a birth time. 
but what we do have is an understanding of all of these planets and how they connect together. Okay. So this person has moon in Libra at 24 degrees and sun in Gemini at 28 degrees. All right. Um, that's moonshine sun by degree. So starting off, that's really good having moonshine sun. Um, it gives them kind of a balanced, uh, interesting personality and, um, having sun in Gemini makes this person gregarious, um, talkative, communicative, and that moon in Libra would make them rather charming. Uh, very interesting. Okay. And then I'm just working from here right now, Chandler, mm. because I understand, you know, I, I might come back over here after you tell me who it is. Mm -hmm. If, if I know, mm -hmm. um, okay. And, uh, Mercury at 21 degrees cancer, Mercury and cancer might make this person more shy than they might have been if they had Mercury in you know, like conjunct Gemini or, or something like that. So we have, um, interest, in, you know, Mercury and cancer makes them more, uh, possibly could even make them psychic, uh, or, or communicate about, um, well, feelings. So, We'll, we'll come back to that. Venus and Taurus would make them want and like very pretty, elegant um, belongings, very earthy. Um, uh, you know, their values deal more with material things than they do uh, esoteric things uh, because their Venus is in Taurus. So this is tangible belongings, you know. And then their Mars is in Gemini at 29 degrees. So their Mars is conjunct their sun. Interesting. Mars conjunct sun. They could have a temper. Hmm. Could have a temper. Uh, and when they have a temper, they are maybe, uh, they're one to, to, to rant, you know? Mars and Gemini would be when you show your anger by ranting, like, like you can really put your words together well, um, and, and, and lay into somebody also Jupiter in Gemini, Jupiter at two degrees. So it is not conjunct to the other planets by, by degree, but it is by sign. So now we have this Jupiter, uh, conjunct by sign Mars and sun trining moon that is a lot of energy and air now we have saturn at five degrees taurus conjunct their venus by sign but not by degree saturn and taurus would be lessons with uh material things it would be lessons with how you make money lessons with, um, your values. Um, interesting. Uranus in Aries, Whew. Uranus in Aries at 16 degrees. Uh, Uranus is the planet of unexpected things. Having Uranus in Aries means could, it could mean unexpected warlike things um, happening in this person's life. And then Neptune in Leo trining that Uranus. Not by degree, but Leo trines Aries. And then Pluto and Capricorn. Ugh. Pluto and Capricorn at two degrees. 
North Node in Aries. So that uh, North no and Chiron in Aquarius. Okay. So here we have one, two, three, four, five planets in air. Um, one, two, three planets in Earth. And two, three, three planets in, in uh, fire. And so this person is, it, it, it would seem that this person would have a nice balance of all of the elements, okay? Um, if we go by this chart that we have right here, if we say that this is their chart, which we don't know because uh, we don't know what time they were born, but maybe you can tell me because in this particular situation, they have ascendant at 28 degrees Virgo, which is on the cusp of Virgo and Libra. So they could have some of their assets, some of their personality be, um, uh, very organized and meticulous and, and a person who, who seems to do very good work. And then on the other hand, they could just be really pretty, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. really pretty, really friendly, uh, very charming. Uh, if we go with the chart, and then having their moon in this particular instance, it falls in their second house, which is the house of, you know, belongings and, and how you make a living, which would make their, everything about their, um, the way they make money is connected to women or emotions or beauty in, in some way. Then we don't have anything in this chart other in the, in the Scorpio part of the second house, we don't have anything in Sagittarius in the third part. Uh, this has Capricorn, I mean, uh, Pluto and Capricorn falling in the fourth house, um, which would put their fourth house, uh, technically their fourth house cusp. Yeah, it's Capricorn. And then Pluto would be um, how they approach everything that is uh, Scorpio. And having Pluto in your fourth house would make you, <laughs> I would jokingly say you have a haunted house, but probably not. Um, but uh, Pluto and Capricorn, so kind of, uh, kind of controlled in those Plutonian aspects, kind of controlled in their, um, in some of their behaviors, in some of their human behaviors, is any of this making any sense? Yeah, yeah. The, there are parts of this that um, make a lot of sense. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. So now we have Chiron in a. Uh, could, could you just go back again to the the, the Pluto uh -huh. and, and the fourth house? Uh -huh. The fourth house has to deal with like right. home, home, right? Home, home, and and community. And country. So that um, could be death and rebirth and in the home. It could be, yeah. Or power. It, mm -hmm, or powerful in the home. Yes. But again, we don't know what time this person was born. So we don't know that their Pluto actually does fall there. But in this scenario, this person has Pluto in Capricorn, which is death and rebirth, which it which would be sort of like death and rebirth with career, death and rebirth of the father. Well, not death and, you know what I mean? But maybe death of the father, a uh, powerful father, uh, because Capricorn is ruled by Saturn and Saturn normally, uh, the good side of Capricorn is very fatherly, you know, older fatherly. And so these are Plutonian aspects that are, which are Scorpio, right? Because Pluto rules Scorpio in Capricorn. So it would be very controlled um, power. It could be controlled power. Uh, let me move on to the other things just so we can kind of get uh, an idea. 
we have Chiron and Aquarius. And in this particular chart, it's at 29 degrees, which it would be at 29 degrees by their birthday. But it's in the fifth house, which is, you know, ruled by Leo in this chart. And as we know, Chiron is the wounded healer. So whatever wounds happen in early life, these are around humanitarian humanity, groups of people, um, and then this person turning to, you know, if they followed their path, they would be able to heal groups of people and, and help, help humanity. Um, then we move to seventh house cusp is, uh, actually, I mean, it's, it's one degree, right? So here we, we look at, at Pisces and Aries. Here we look at Virgo and Libra in this particular scenario. And we have Uranus um, in Aries, conjunct North Node in Aries. And it is not, uh, it's, it's close enough to be by degree because these are, you know, just four, four, degrees away from each other. So when you have Uranus and North node in Aries, there's going to be something about military or war or leadership or, uh, something's going on here with aspects of Aries because this person has North node in Aries and Uranus. So unexpected, situations, maybe technological, uh, technological breakthroughs in, um, dealing with the military, uh, something like that. Then this person has Saturn in Taurus. Um, in this it's in the eighth house. So if, if this were their real chart, they would have lessons with eighth house things. So lending and borrowing money. Um, it would be lessons with, uh, um, taboo things, um, sexuality or control, control of those things. In this situation, whatever it is, Saturn and Taurus, no matter what house it's in, is going to be lessons with valuables, um, how you make money, the way you spend your money, uh, those kind of things. Then we have Jupiter, uh, at two degrees, Gemini and Venus at 26 degrees Taurus. So these two are, are, are very, they're close enough to affect each other, Jupiter and Venus, even though this Jupiter is in, um, Gemini and the Venus is in Taurus, they're close enough to affect each other uh, since they're not in the same sign. But this Jupiter is right on the cusp of Gemini. You see that? Mm -hmm. It's only two degrees. So these two can play well together and be benevolent in uh, love and things you love, uh, bringing them to you, you know, like gifts. And then here we have sun at 28 degrees, Gemini, Mars at 29 degrees, Gemini, and Mercury at 21 degrees, Cancer. In this chart, all falling in the 10th house, which would make this person have the availability of a, a very good career if this were the right birth time. Uh, even if it is not the right birth time, this Mars conjunct sun in Gemini makes this person very driven because Mars is your drive and Mars is your goal setting and your ability to reach your goals and, and your motivation. And they have Mars conjunct sun in Gemini. So the sun is like your essence and uh, it's conjunct one degree different. So they're very driven, this person should be. And then Mercury in Cancer would give them a, it should give them a creatively um, 
maybe uh, languid, um, easy uh, way of communicating, if that makes any sense. And then Neptune in Leo. So Neptune in Leo is an interesting placement because Neptune is illusion and what and things are veiled. You don't know all the information. It is creativity. It is psychic ability. It is supernatural things. It is um, anything. It's storytelling. It's it's the bard. And then having it in Leo would be creative leadership. Um, uh, using using your intuition to lead, uh, things like that. So that's very interesting. And, uh, okay, so I've gone through all of the planets, okay? Um, it, it's always so hard for me when I don't have a real birth time. Or even, like, if you have a birth time, and even sometimes with a birth time in these older charts, we don't know for sure if it's the right time, but did, does this sound... Like yeah. I'm on the right track? Yes, yes. Oh, uh, okay. I think that there are a lot, lots of things here that, that uh, make sense. Um, the unexpected uh, military mm -hmm. um, and that also being the direction in life. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, power, death and rebirth involving home. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a, a lot of these, even the, the taboo... Uh, sexuality stuff. There's a lot mm -hmm. of things that make sense here. Oh, okay. Do you have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, can you, you've already talked a little bit about this, but uh, what what can you tell us about his connection to his country? Well, if this were the correct chart, then I would say that there was power and control in connection to their country. But since this is not necessarily, most likely not the right time of birth, then I'm going to go look at um, what this person has in cancer, which normally rules the fourth house. Okay. So this person has mercury and cancer. So, I would say that if we were doing their chart with having them be born at midnight, it would probably fall in the fourth house anyway. But I would think that they would they would talk a lot about their home and their country. Like they would be able to um, gather people to uh, join them uh, or be on the same page with them about their home and their country and their community. Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, can you get any sense of what kind of a student this person would be? Well, again, when I go to, um, you know, intellectual things, I go to Mercury, and this is the same situation. This person is, um, you know fairly bright, um, maybe not, you know, the smartest kid in the class, but maybe, I mean, they do have uh, Mars conjunct Sun and Jupiter all in Gemini, which should make them pretty quick, pretty quick witted also. Okay. Um, what is this person's relationship with romance? Uh, romance, I go to Venus and I would say that, remember what I said about this Venus is in Taurus, but it's, uh, very close to Jupiter because Jupiter is only two degrees. Gemini, here you have, um, a person who probably, uh, doesn't have a lot of problem in the romance area. In fact, with this Jupiter in Taurus, I would assume he's very romantic Okay. Um, and how would women see him? This is a difficult one because we don't know what the rising sign is. 
If we were to go with this, we have 28 degrees of Virgo, which would make him appear very uh, smart and um, quick and uh, um, uh, organized and um, very, uh, you know, all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. But mm. since we don't have this for sure that i'm just going to go to their sun and i'm going to say that because they have sun and gemini uh conjunct mars and jupiter they're probably fairly charming and um uh uh i mean i can't tell you like what they look like i don't have any any point of reference for what they look like but okay. i would assume that they were uh with all these planets in gemini you can be fun you know you 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 have this fun aspect to you or you should have kind of a fun aspect if you don't have good gemini aspects you can be kind of um too much you know like you're pff, like like too many lines like hey baby you do you come here often? You? <laughs> that kind of thing. You know what I mean? That's a dark side of Gemini males. They're kind of too much. It's like, oh, no, don't, don't, don't. But I just get the feeling that this person is probably lighter and more charming and mm -hmm. uh, very good talker. Okay. Okay. Uh, is this a persuasive person? It could be. It could be very persuasive. Whenever you have this much Gemini, uh, in your chart and then trining moon in Libra, which would be very charming, you know, uh, I would think that this person could be very persuasive. I just don't think that people realize what kind of a temper this person could have. Mm. It could be explosive. I mean, they have Uranus in Aries conjunct North node. So they could have an, ex an explosive temper, but they have Mercury in cancer. So, you know, they might, they might be able to tone it down a little bit. Uh, how does this person feel about authority? Um, again, I don't really have a place to put these planets, right? So I would think with the planets that this person has, maybe they don't take it too seriously i just get the feeling that they feel that you know i don't know maybe they are in charge they do have north node and aries so they might be at the authority is this a timid person i do not think this is a timid person i think this person has the ability to uh charm and, and, and talk to people. They do have Mercury in Cancer, but that doesn't necessarily make them timid. It might wisen up some of this Gemini and help them not just blurt things out. It might make them a little more wiser. Okay. Is this a lucky person? Probably. Probably so. This person with this Jupiter, like, I mean, I know, again, this Jupiter's in Gemini and this Venus is in Taurus, but... They're close enough together to get along really well. So this could be a lucky person. Lucky with um, material things. Uh, is there anything else that uh, you haven't uh, pointed out already? Um, not in this situation where I don't know what their true houses are. Um, I think I'm kind of, you know at a loss without, you know, whenever we don't know what, what, what the real houses are. Maybe if I know this person, if I'm aware of this person, I might be able to get a better idea or have a better guess of what we think their first house cusp would be. But as far as all the planets are concerned, those are all correct. Those are all, um, those aren't going to change. Okay. Uh, are we ready for our summary of our findings? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first you said this is, uh, he would have a balanced personality, uh, would be gregarious, communicative, 
charming, uh, but possibly shy. Uh, he could possibly have a psychic ability, um, could communicate effectively about feelings. Uh, he would want pretty belongings. Uh, his values are set in the physical world. He could have a temper. Uh, when he does have his temper, he is prone to ranting. Uh, he is well-spoken, energetic. Uh, there's lessons to be learned with money and with values. Uh, there's unexpected warlike things. Uh, the way he makes his money is connected with women and beauty. Uh, there's, uh, he is powerful in the home, in the community, in the country. Uh, there's death and rebirth with career and the country. Uh, there's a controlled power. Uh, there's wounds uh, to learn from uh, that uh, involve humanity, and if he learns those, then his purpose is to help humanity. Uh, there is a military war leadership as the purpose in his life. Uh, unexpected situations with the military. Uh, there could be lessons with lending money, uh, lessons with taboo things, possibly lessons with taboo sexuality. Uh, he, is he is benevolent in love, uh, bringing loved ones gifts. He is driven. Uh, he has an easy way of communicating. He uses intuition to lead. Uh, power and control with the country. Talk a lot about home and country. Gather people to join them uh, in his uh, crusades for the country. Uh, he is bright, but maybe not the smartest. Uh, he is quick-witted, very romantic. Women would see him as charming. He would have a fun personality, but the dark side, he might be a little sleazy. Uh, he could be persuasive could have an explosive temper. Uh, don't, uh, he doesn't take uh, authority very seriously um, unless he is the authority. He might be the authority. Uh, he is not a timid person and is probably very fortunate. Is there anything that I left out? No, that's pretty much spot on. The only thing was some of the uh, aspects that you gave were based on the houses, and I'm not sure what his houses are so but yes that's pretty much that's pretty much where we are uh -huh. okay uh well uh this uh, episode will be coming out on the uh friday uh after uh saint patrick's day and in addition to us being very proud texans uh both of us are very proud of our irish heritage uh so we thought it'd be fitting or at least i did mom has no idea what's going on <laughs> Uh, I thought it'd be fitting to focus on one of the major figures in Irish history. Uh, so this is the astrological birth chart of Theobald Wolf Tone. Okay, uh -huh. who's this? Uh-huh, so uh, Theobald Wolf Tone, uh, of course... In, in the long saga of Irish history, Ireland was... Uh, ruled in some form or manner by the English uh, for over 800 years. Um, he was the sort of uh, a spokesperson leader of the uh, rebellion of 1798. Um, and this is really the first rebellion. He is kind of the first person to put out there that there is an Irish country, that all of these people, despite all of the religious things that pull them apart, um, can come together and be their own country, and that can be a republic. He is really the father of a republican Ireland. Mm. Um, his revolution did not succeed, but many of those rebellions that happened afterwards, including the the successful one in the 1920s look to wolf tone as this grand hero as the man who put it all together that ireland is a country we are not supposed to be separated by our religions and our status and all these things we are all irish men and women and uh we we deserve to have our own country uh so he is sort of the one who put that out there or at least uh, uh really uh, uh conceptualized that and could make that easily digestible for people 
Uh, so uh, Theobald Wolf Tone uh, was born June uh, 30. Uh, Yes, June 30th, uh, 1763, uh, in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, his uh, father uh, was named Peter, and he was a Protestant. Uh, he was a coachmaker in uh, County Kildare. Uh, his mother uh, was a Catholic, uh, but had converted to uh, Protestantism uh, to uh, when, when she married uh, Peter uh, Tone. Uh, and uh, growing up... Uh, Theobald was not the greatest student. Um, he did not enjoy school. Uh, he did something, uh, the, the, the term in Ireland is called mitching, uh, which uh, means to skip school. Uh, he didn't oh. really uh, think that he needed to be there. He liked being at the beach. Uh, so he would go walk down to the beach and he would go and um, have a grand time of things. And then uh, he would come back and uh, he'd take his tests, uh, see what they know over at school. But then a lot of times he was gone and he was off having his own little <laughs> adventures. Um, but somehow he's managed to uh, uh, get through school and was well enough to get into Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, but he very he continued this uh, uh, way of studying. Uh, he would mitch, he would go off, he would uh, go to uh, have extravagant balls all over Dublin, meeting all sorts of women and dancing all hours of the night. And uh, he wouldn't study throughout the term, and then it would come to exams, and he would cram and cram and cram uh, to get to the exams. And then if he didn't make the best grades on the exams, he said, well, the examiner has it out for me. Uh, it wasn't ever his fault. It oh, was always no. uh, that the, the, the test was rigged or whatnot. Uh, but not not so much focused on on his studies as having a good time of things um during this time at trinity college uh in irish politics and uh the uh, elite society uh, it was very fashionable that if you felt that you were insulted uh you would uh challenge uh the insulting party to a duel uh ireland and irish politics uh, was known for uh, duels happening all over the place and a lot of them were duels to the death and uh, during this time, uh, Theobald, uh, was, he served as the second uh, to uh, another duel, uh, meaning he was in charge of uh, he was in charge of loading the weapons and uh, selecting the place uh, for having the duel. And he was very much involved in this duel, which did end up in, in uh, one of the dueling people was killed. Uh, oh, my. So uh, he being a part of this, uh, there was a hearing held at Trinity College um, about this, and uh, they decide not to expel him because it, it really would be uh, uh, ironic seeing that so many people in Irish society were dueling all the time to have actually expelled someone for this. But they suspended him for a year. Uh, which was fine because he didn't really like what he was doing at college anyway. Uh, so uh, his parents got him a job as the tutor uh, to uh, the Martin family. Uh, so what's really great about this is that Richard Martin, uh, he was uh, one of the members of the Irish Parliament, and uh, he was one of the greatest duelists uh, in Ireland. Uh, so it's sort of funny that he was punished uh, by taking a year off of school and serving one of the greatest duelists in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so he uh, was in charge of tutoring uh, the Martin's children. Uh, Richard Martin, uh, a, a very good dueler, a very good orator as an uh, MP in the Irish Parliament. He was also involved uh, in forming one of the first humane societies uh, in the British Isles. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, he did not care about uh, killing human beings, but if, <laughs> if you hurt a dog, uh, then he might challenge you to a duel. Oh, um, no. uh, so... Uh, he uh, Theobald was involved in teaching uh, the Martin family uh, uh, whatever lessons, which, again, is also funny because Theobald wasn't the greatest student himself. And now he's mm -hmm. a teacher. Um, also, while this is happening, Theobald uh, began having romantic feelings towards uh, Richard Martin's wife, uh, Eliza. Yeah. 
Oh, no. Uh, and I uh, fell madly in love with the woman. Uh, eventually, somehow they got involved in doing a play together, and she played uh, the role of Matilda, and he was the love interest uh, of Matilda, and he just got it all in his head that they should elope. They should run away together. Um but he didn't follow up on that. Uh, he never <laughs> proposed anything to the woman. Um, and then a few years later, he found out that uh, she ran away with somebody else. Uh, so oh, no! uh, he was very upset. He missed his chance. He could have oh, been my. with Eliza Martin. Um, but uh, he was back at uh, Trinity College and uh, doing his studies. Um, he would uh, eventually uh, go through Trinity and then he would go to London to study to be a lawyer. Uh, he uh, became a lawyer and by his own admission, he says that uh, he was one of the worst lawyers that there ever could be. Um, and, uh, he went, he, he went back to Ireland and, uh, actually uh, I skipped over a part. He, he did meet, uh, another woman. Um, this woman, uh, uh, was, uh, the little sister of one of the, uh, one of his schoolmates. Um, but he didn't like the schoolmate very much. Um, but he liked the little sister a lot. Uh, so he just showed up at the house one day and decided that he was going to be friends now with this, uh, schoolmate. Um, and, uh, the, 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 this was the Witheringtons and, uh, the boy, he played the viola and, uh, uh, Theobald played the violin. So they decide they get a little band together and, uh, <laughs> you know what? Hey, you know, your little sister, she's pretty cool. Let's, uh, I'm just going to talk to her the whole time anyway. And eventually they did elope. They ran away together and they eloped and, uh, Martha, um, Witherington uh, got married to Theobald Wolftone. Uh, now, of course, it's pretty uh, average uh, for the bride to change her last name, um, but Theobald asked her to change her first name, too. Oh, no! Uh, he asked her to change her first name to Matilda. <gasps> no! And she did. And so oh, no. the rest of her life, she was known as Matilda uh, Tone. <sighs> Uh, so, uh, now that had happened, now, back, getting back into this, uh, he goes off to London, uh, to study to be a lawyer, and he writes in his memoirs that, uh, the English, uh, do not take very good care of their wives, uh, and so he was going to do that for them. <gasps> Oh no! He he was he was quite the rogue. He was quite the rogue gentleman. Oh my! Uh, he then uh, comes back to Ireland, and as all uh, failed lawyers do, he decides to become a politician. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he does very well. He's sort of like uh, the PR man, the spin doctor for the Whig Party. Uh, at this time, he is still a very committed uh, to the English crown, uh, to Parliament, and uh, to. To, uh, uh, Lord Pitt, who is uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, at first, he wrote uh, asking to uh, join the army. He wanted to fight uh, the American Revolution for the British. Oh, my. Um, and then that didn't, his mom wouldn't let him. And so okay. uh, later on, uh, he asked uh, Lord Pitt if he could have an army commission uh, to go to Hawaii and uh, attack Spanish ships and bring okay. that plunder to England. So this was a man searching <laughs> for adventure. Sure. Uh, then, and uh, he had an Irish mother uh -huh. who told him no. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, so uh, he's working uh, in Dublin as sort of the uh, PR man for the Whig Party and the Irish Parliament, and uh, he... Uh, comes across this man named uh, Thomas Russell. And Thomas Russell is a uh, committed uh, Irish patriot. Uh, he believes that Ireland uh, uh, needs to have, you know, it needs to keep its separate parliament. It needs to uh, bring, he's, he's starting these ideas of separatism, that Ireland should not even be connected to England at all. And at first, uh, Theobald uh, gets, they, they have a huge argument uh, and they fight it out and then they decide to go to a pub and drink afterwards and they become great mm -hmm. friends oh. they become the best of friends and uh, thomas and theobald decide that they need to create a new club uh mm -hmm. called the ireland uh, uh the the union of ireland sure. uh 
and uh, that this was going to be truly uh, for all Irishmen. Uh, uh-huh. Theobald eventually writes this piece. It's a very eloquent piece about how um, that so many people do not trust uh, the Catholic people in Ireland, that uh, Catholics are 80 percent of the population of Ireland. They are ruled by a, a, a slim uh, minority of Protestants um, and that uh, uh, the, it, it's wrong that they, they don't have a seat in government. They don't have a seat uh, a way of uh, uh, ruling themselves and that Catholics that there's nothing different in the way that they, they're certainly capable of ruling they're certainly capable of logic and and all these things um, and that we as Irishmen, whether we are Presbyterians, whether we are Anglicans, whether we are Catholics, all come together as Irishmen for ourselves um, and that uh, Catholics don't shouldn't be discriminated against anymore. Uh, and uh, this is all fine and good until uh, the American Revolution starts brewing up and uh, uh, it comes to an end, but then the French Revolution comes right at the heels, and now it's starting to see, you know, uh, that revolution isn't 3,000 miles away. Now it's right across the channel, and those revolutionaries are cutting off the heads of all of the aristocrats in France, and it's only a matter of time before that same sort of ideas uh, might get into the English and the Irish mindset. So the English uh, declare war on France, and they uh, really go after anybody who has anything bad to say about the English government and the way that they're running things. Uh, and uh, this whole idea of bringing everyone in Ireland together, uh, well, what are they bringing them together for? Uh, maybe to go after the English. Uh, so uh, the whole uh, Union uh, of Ireland, that was uh, a banned club. You could no longer be a member of that club. The club had to disperse, had to be meeting in secret. Um Theobald himself, uh, he ran away in seventeen uh, ninety. Uh, uh, in seventeen ninety five, he ran to the United States. Mm. Uh, in the United States, he did not have a very good time. Uh, <laughs> he got involved in some bad uh, land speculation deals in Philadelphia. Um, he didn't uh, particularly like how the Americans had created their republic, um, mm. and this is a time where the Americans were still figuring everything out. George Washington was going around and he he wasn't a king, but he still did things that a king would do. Mm -hmm. Uh, He refused to shake hands with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, He uh, would uh, sit in the center of a room and have everyone equidistant to him and have an audience with people, which is what a king would do. So Mm -hmm. there were still all these uh, uh, drippings of monarchism in the American Republic, and Theobald did not want any part of it. He didn't like how really they just replaced one uh, aristocracy with the other, and this American aristocracy had nothing to do with birth. It was just how much money you could make off of someone. Mm -hmm. Um, So he, uh, eventually he wrote in his memoirs that he would rather his daughter be dead than marry an American. Wow. Uh, He did not like it. Uh, So uh, (laughs) he decided to go over to France. Oh, that'll be much better. (laughs) So, uh, in 17- no offense, French people who are listening, we love you. I love everything about France. Uh, so in 1796, uh, he uh, goes to France, which is uh, sort of, uh, it, it's an active war against England. It is uh, in this uh, uh, middle period of the French Revolution or close to the, uh, there's a, some stability involved, but uh, there's, it's 1790s France. There's a lot going on. Um And uh, Theobald goes to France and he wants France to invade Ireland Uh, because if France can invade Ireland, then the Irish people can have their own republic. And from Ireland, the the French can go into England and do whatever they want to the English. He doesn't care. (laughs) Oh, no. Uh, So uh, uh, Theobald, he meets with uh, Delacroix and uh, Carnot, uh, the leaders uh, of the military, and the French... He just, yeah, uh, they 
uh, love him. They go, uh, uh, he's very persuasive, and they decide they're going to launch an invasion of Ireland. Oh, uh, wow. They promise uh, 43 ships uh, with 15,000 troops uh, to uh, invade Ireland. Uh, he is, uh, Theobald is convinced that once they invade Ireland, um, they will uh, be able to uh, convince all of the uh, Catholics and all of the Protestants uh, who believe in an Irish Republic to join them and that they will overwhelm what English troops are there. Uh, the, uh, the, they actually do uh, quite a bit of savvy uh, espionage work um, that, because uh, the main problem isn't the English army, it's the English navy. That's always the biggest problem. Um, so they start leaving all of these notes in Portuguese uh, around where they know the English spies to be saying that the French are going to Portugal. The French are going to Portugal. So okay. all of the English uh, ships leave and they go to Portugal. <gasps> Oh, that's very good. And uh, in the, uh, the, but they know that they have to attack in the winter time because in the summertime the visibility is going to be too great, and they're going to be able to spot uh, forty-three French ships coming. Uh, so they leave when it's terrible weather in the middle of December, uh, and they uh, make it to Ireland. Well, some of them make it to Ireland. Uh, uh, they again this is really this whole uh, uh invasion of bantry bay um it's a comedy of errors so many oh things had to go wrong so first of all during the french revolution uh they killed off all of the greatest admirals uh because all of the admirals were royalists and aristocrats yeah so they have a navy that is being led by not their best admirals <laughs> No. Then they decide to put all 14 of their admirals on one ship. <gasps> no. Oh, no. <laughs> they decide that the best thing to do is to split uh, this uh, 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 the, the grouping of ships, the 43 ships, into two groups. Well, the group that had the ship with all the admirals gets lost. Oh, no. They get lost in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. <gasps> Now, uh, the other group of ships, they, they get to, uh, Bantry Bay. So they are right off the southern coast of Ireland and they are set to invade. They don't know where the other group is, but they'll get to that problem when they need to. Um, and Theobald is overjoyed. He hasn't seen Ireland in, in several years at this point. Um, and, and now he, he feels he's so close that he could reach out and touch it. He said that he could, if he had a biscuit, he could throw it onto the shore. Um, but the weather is absolutely terrible. There are, it's like they write down that it's like a hurricane, that there's a hurricane going on outside the coast, that the winds are, are humongous, the gales are moving all the ships around. It is, the, the French are, are not, uh, feeling that it is safe enough to land these ships. Um, the, the he writes that at some points uh, he gets very happy about uh, this whole thing that everything he wants is coming to 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 fruition here mm -hmm. uh, the french are about to invade ireland um mm -hmm. and he is so proud of the french and he sees well they're not scared at all they they're just sitting around and they're singing and they're playing cards and and then things start to go wrong and they're still singing and playing cards and he goes What's the matter with all these people? Why are they just singing and playing cards? <laughs> One of the French officers had just gotten married, and he okay. snuck his bride onto the <gasps> ship. Oh, no. Uh, so bef he snuck her in as an officer, uh, and uh, eventually they, they figured out that she was not. Um and but it, it actually improved the behavior of the uh, Frenchmen once they discovered that there was a woman on board. Uh, they were not uh, cussing as much, um, but uh, the, they were also distracted uh, by uh, this young woman. And Theopold didn't understand. He wrote, "She isn't that very good looking." Oh my! Uh, in fact, she used to be a prostitute. Oh no! <laughs> oh, no. Oh, 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 no. Which I think that might be why they were treating her so well. Um, <laughs> oh, no. So after, this is great. after days of, of being at, at, at the base, gazing at the shore, they realize that they can't do it, that the weather's too bad, and they turn around and they go back to France. 
uh, Theobald is just uh, 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 despondent. He he writes uh, that uh, he might as he's not an Irishman anymore. He'll have to oh. live in France for the rest of his life. Oh. He'll have to become a Frenchman. Oh no. Um, uh, uh, and and what is so amazing about this is that had they landed, the English wrote later afterwards that they only had a small grouping in Cork and in Limerick and that if a French force of that size would have landed they would have run that the English would have run to Dublin Uh, and so that would have allowed them to get the momentum of attracting all of these other Irishmen to get to Dublin and they who knows what could have happened from that point it it, it is it this was probably the closest that the English ever came to losing Ireland uh, uh, before the, the, the 20th century. Um, wow. it, uh, th- that so many things had to happen to go wrong for this to ha- happen. You've put on top of that that the French general who was in charge of all this uh, was a man by the name of Hoche. Hoche was the greatest French general. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, His ship uh, made it back to France, but it crashed when it got to France. He swam to shore. He then got pneumonia and he died. <gasps> oh, Hoche was probably the only man who could have prevented Napoleon from coming to power. Wow. All of it connected to this one incident in December of 1796. Oh, uh, they then make plans for another invasion. Uh, they decide that they want to go directly to England this time. They want to go to England's second largest city, which is Bristol. Um, and they they say they're going to burn it to the ground. Uh, men, women, and children doesn't matter. Wow. Um, and Wolf Tone uh, is a little uh, uh, he doesn't know what to think about that, but he eventually decides that they deserve it. That after yeah. all the things that they've done to the Irish people, um, that that's fine. They don't quite make it to Bristol. Uh, instead, they make it to some town in Wales. Uh, they uh, get into Wales. They get drunk. Uh, they then get back on the ship and they leave. <laughs> oh, no! Uh, but even that, even that, just the French guys getting off the ship, getting drunk and leaving, caused such a panic in the financial system of England <laughs> that the banks, uh, there was a run on the banks in London for days. Oh my. That it crippled the English economy. So what would have happened if they had actually taken Ireland? It just would have been astronomical, but it, it wasn't meant to be. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, Wolf Tone felt that he was so lucky that he could just keep going on these excursions, uh, but he was captured um, uh, in a boat uh, off the coast of Ireland and put on trial. Uh, during that whole time, though... Um, There was a rebellion because uh, the English were so scared at how close they had come to losing Ireland that Mm -hmm. they cracked down mercilessly on the Irish people. Mm -hmm. Um, There are stories that that there is a man who was a commander. He was named uh, they called him Burning Bacon. Uh, His last name was Bacon. And he would go into towns and he would light the houses on fire. Mm -hmm. He would find the families and he would stick them back into the house Mm -hmm. so that they could burn with their house. It was brutal, brutal reprisals. Mm-hmm. And the, rebel- the, the rebels were also doing brutal things, too. They would find English uh, or Protestants or whoever, and they would burn them with themselves still in the houses mm-hmm. as well. But it was absolutely uh, merciless what, what the government was doing. Um, and that rebellion did not lead to an independent Ireland. It was not organized enough. And... Uh, they they started turning on each other, which is exactly what Theobald didn't want to do. The mm-hmm. the Protestants started turning on the Catholics and the Presbyterians on, and it it just completely fell apart. Mm-hmm. Um, and Theobald was in in prison, hearing about all of this. He was uh, put on trial, um, and he was uh, found guilty. Um, and, uh, he, uh, was sentenced, uh, to be executed. He decided to do the job himself and he slit his own throat to make (gasps) sure that an Englishman wouldn't do it. Oh, wow. Um, 
the legacy of Wolf Tone is immense in Irish Republican uh, psyche. Um, every rebellion that happens in the rest of the 1800s and the 1900s uh, credits Wolf Tone when, with the with the uh, uh, being the articulate person to put together this idea of an Ireland for Irish men and women that the religion did not matter. Um, in 1913, uh, the uh, group of revolutionaries uh, coming up, um, they went to Wolf Tone's um, grave, and uh, Patrick Pierce, who is one of the uh, he was one of the major leaders of the 1916 Easter Rebellion. Uh, he uh, said a speech uh, at uh, Wolf Tone's grave. He said, uh, "We have come to the holiest place in Ireland." Holier uh, even than the place where Patrick sleeps and down, uh, meaning St. Patrick. Um, Patrick uh, brought us life, but this man died for us. And though many before him and some since have died in testimony of the truth of Ireland's claim to nationhood, Wolf Tone was the greatest of all that have made that testimony, the greatest of all that have died for Ireland, whether in old time or in new. He was the greatest of Irish nationalists. I believe he was the greatest of Irish men. Aww. Uh Theobald uh, Wolf Tone, uh, uh, still a controversial figure in in uh, English uh, politics today. Uh, they uh, the BBC that I saw doing research that there was a whole documentary made about Wolf Tone, uh, and the BBC decided not to air it. Um, he is still a symbol to the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and they are known for doing, uh, you know, the terrorist acts against uh, uh, civilians in England. Um, and uh, they claim that they are the holders of Wolf Tone's legacy. Um, others uh, would not, would say that those tactics are not quite what Wolf Tone uh, was going for, um, but a, a truly uh, remarkable person uh, and, and who took all of the ideals of the American and French Revolution to Ireland to try and uh, make those people uh, free of English rule, and uh, his legacy would eventually get that to happen. Wow. That is very interesting. I have never heard of this gentleman, but I am uh, very um, proud of what he wanted to do, even though he seems to have had a very interesting way of doing it. But it also sounds like just in general, people of that time uh, had this... Uh, way of doing things where you know you come in the ship and you get off the ship and you get drunk and then you go get off the <laughs> ship and you go away i mean they uh -huh. had there was no real you know laser point strategy for whatever they were doing but you know it seems like his heart was in the right place although he doesn't have a lot of respect for women um all, but on the other he hand, likes he them a lot to like him a lot he but likes him a doesn't lot. Doesn't respect him a lot, but he does. He does like him a lot. Um, I think that this chart. Uh, I am very sure that he does not have uh, Virgo rising because he does not sound like someone who has Virgo rising. But also, all of his attempts, right? That North Node in Aries, that North Node needing to do the military stuff right mm -hmm. needing to do it but then having uranus there knocking him out just knock, <laughs> knocking him out of the way no 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 you know he gets things going in it that uranus comes along and just slaps him like a cat and uh then having neptune in leo um also interfering with his ability to get a clear shot you know mm -hmm. a clear leadership cut and dry that's too all over the place you know it's it's veiled but definitely being able to talk people into it definitely being able to charm people into it and uh uh having that you know wounded healer wanting wanting to you know save the people it's very interesting i'm I'm very happy to know about this man. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was looking for a lot of different people, but many of the, the greatest of Ireland's uh, rebellion leaders don't even have a birthday. Uh, huh. so, uh, the, uh, this guy, I, I found the birthday and I was like, well, that's, that's, that'll have to do. Cause this story is too great. It is a really good story. Uh, well, uh, I think on our scale of right on the money to way out in outer space, this is, uh, somewhere in the middle, but, uh, closer, closer to the, to the bullseye than, than others. Um, I think that, you know, the unexpected things with the military and yeah. uh, the things with, uh, you know, the going after married women, uh, mm-hmm. the taboo sexuality stuff. I think there's a lot of things that, that are, are pretty close. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think the pretty close. Yeah, I think that the planets reveal his personality. We just don't have an exact placement of the houses or what his rising sign is, but. The, the planets definitely reveal this this person, you know. Uh, well, that uh, concludes uh, this episode of History in Retrograde. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you would like to uh, support the podcast, uh, we're, our, uh, our socials, uh, Facebook, Instagram, our Gmail, that's all posted in the uh, episode description. Uh, please reach out to us. Let us know uh, what your thoughts are on the show, suggestions uh, for uh, future uh, mystery history guests, or uh, just uh, comments of encouragement. Uh, and uh, it, it, there's also a link to our uh, PayPal account. If uh, you're feeling uh, generous, uh, every little bit uh, helps us uh, to get uh, better equipment and uh, produce a better show for you. And uh, I think uh, that gets us to uh, our conclusion. So as long as uh, your houses are in order and the stars are aligned, everything will be just fine. Everything's going to be just fine. And I just want to say thank you to all of our listeners as well. Uh, Chandler, I really think that um, the feedback that we're getting is wonderful. People really enjoy your history. They seem to enjoy my astrology. And uh, they're telling people about the show and they're helping to support the show as they can. We do love it if you go to the Facebook and post a comment. Um, love it if you send us any information like if you you know send to channel you'd love to see so and so uh their chart to be done we'd love to hear that so we just really greatly appreciate all of you thank you so much yes uh thank you so very much uh, we, we love hearing back from you and uh yeah thank you so much bye-bye thank you bye-bye Salile Creek Studios.